Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Grante, and on the show today, we have another chapter in season 11 of my audiobook series. Today is chapter two of Designing Reality, tips and tricks for surviving in the third digital revolution, based primarily around the concept of fabrication. If you haven't already yet, like, subscribe, and bell to get consistent content, and thank you for watching. Without further ado, chapter two of Designing Reality. This video is part of an audiobook series featuring Designing Reality, How to Survive and Thrive in the Third Digital Revolution by the Gershenfeld Brothers in 2017. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel, find me on Spotify, or visit my website for downloads. Chapter 2. How to Almost Make Anything Anyone who has visited a thriving fab lab immediately picks up on the incredible energy, joy, and satisfaction that comes from harnessing the power of digital fabrication to design and making things. The early fab pioneers who Neil profiled in Chapter 1 and others who we will introduce are generating new models of highly distributed, personalized fabrication that may indeed transform how we live, learn, work, and play. Neil highlights how people are increasingly able to make everything from food to furniture and from crafts to computers in community fab labs. These are early indicator indications of how the third digital revolution will empower individuals and communities to become globally connected and locally self-sufficient, especially as the technology continues to exponentially improve. But Neil told only a part of the story. Not every fab lab is thriving, and not everyone is thriving in a fab lab. Digital fabrication is a complex process involving multiple interdependent and evolving technologies and capabilities. While the potential exists for people to increasingly make what they consume, very few people are currently able to do so. Many of the raw materials used in today's fab labs are not renewable. There are large gaps between the potential for digital fabrication to transform society and the reality of it doing so. Neil is a classic techno-optimist. His optimism is grounded in a deep understanding of the underlying science, his daily interactions with the pioneering early adopters, and the research roadmap. But he often greatly underestimates how social factors become significant rate limiters to the pace of technology development, as well as how the technology ultimately impacts, or doesn't impact, society. In this chapter, we present additional perspectives on the current FAB ecosystem with the goal of providing social balance to the technology picture. While it is important to understand the current capabilities of the technology and the success, success stories throughout the FAB ecosystem, we also need to understand the challenges and tensions that permeate the ecosystem. Building on what is working and addressing what isn't are both essential to realizing the power and promise of the third digital revolution. The first two digital revolutions created great wealth in transformational changes, but they also left much of the planet behind. More than a half a century after the publication of Gordon Moore's paper, we still have significant digital divides. Half the planet lacks access to digital technologies. In much of the world, a combination of income and wealth inequality, technological unemployment, and digital echo chambers are deeply dividing society. Many people are struggling with an always-on life increasingly mediated by digital technologies. The third digital revolution could help address these social challenges, or it could make them much worse. The pace at which these technologies evolve from the lab and their impact on society, for good or ill, should and will not be driven by some invisible hand. Progress will be driven by the decisions we make and the priorities we set, individually and collectively, as the technologies are introduced into society. The best time to shape the trajectory of accelerating technologies is early, when the research priorities are emerging, assumptions are being baked in, and the ecosystem of supporting organizations and institutions is being formed. The time is now for the third digital revolution. In conducting research for this book, we have visited fab labs and other maker spaces around the world, interviewed dozens of fab and maker pioneers, and surveyed hundreds more. Across these communities, we have observed a striking mix of exhilaration and frustration, a combination of deep optimism and serious concerns about the future of digital fabrication. 
Neil highlighted the optimism and exhilaration in Chapter 1. However, knowing what's possible with the technology does not guarantee that this potential will be realized. We need to have a clear-eyed view of these challenges to develop and advance the methods and mindsets to effectively address them. It will not be easy. In early 2016, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, announced its new initiative tackling next-generation social science. Adam Russell, the program officer, highlighted how the social sciences have been, quote, inherently challenged because of its subject matter. Human beings, with all their complex variability and seeming unpredictability. He continued, Physicists have joked about how much more difficult their field would be if atoms or electrons had personalities, but that is exactly the situation faced by social scientists. End quote. Digital technologies detect and correct errors as they propagate. People also try to detect and correct errors, but the process is more complex and messy. Throughout this book, we look not only at the technology, but also at the less predictable human side of the third digital revolution. The basic contours of human nature are not likely to change anytime soon, even as technological capability races ahead. The good news is that we will continue to dream, create, and shape our world with individual and collective agency. The bad news is that this dreaming, creating, and shaping will not always tap into our better selves. Attention to the social dimensions of the third digital revolution requires examining underlying assumptions about human nature and the ability for individuals, organizations, and institutions to adapt to accelerating change. It may be easier to shape bits and atoms than people in society, but they are inextricably intertwined. The title of this chapter is a play on the name of Neil's How to Make Almost Anything class. When projects failed, students joked that the class felt like more like how to almost make anything. This sentiment often ripples through the broader FAB community and speaks to the very real challenges that come with attempting to democratize manufacturing. In this chapter, we explore some of those threshold challenges, including issues around FAB access, FAB literacy, the cultivation of an enabling FAB ecosystem, and the mitigation of risk as the technology propagates. In Chapter 4, we provide historical context for how social systems have been mostly reactive to new technologies and suggest proactive alternatives. We conclude in Chapter 6 with aspirational visions for FAB futures that align social and technical systems to create a more self-sufficient, interconnected, and sustainable society, along with specific guidance for addressing the challenges and transforming aspirational visions into reality. FAB Access By 2017, there were about a thousand FAB labs around the world, reaching a total of a few hundred thousand people. There are approximately seven billion people on the planet. Neil has shown how FAB labs can transform people's lives, but there is a real risk that these benefits will be enjoyed by only a fortunate few. Throughout all our interviews, there was a common concern about a potentially dangerous FAB divide if widespread access to digital fabrication technologies is not a priority and too many people are left behind. Thus, FAB access is the first threshold challenge. Every breakthrough in technology has created gaps in society. The first two digital revolutions created enormous wealth and massive change around the globe, but not everyone has benefited. Billions of people still have no access to computers or the internet, lacking the basic digital infrastructure necessary to participate in the coming third digital revolution. The growth of the internet is both an exemplar for the third digital revolution, illustrating that exponential change is possible, and a reason for caution, given the pervasive digital divides. In 1983, the TCP-IP, or Transmission Control Protocol slash Internet Protocol, made interoperability among the growing network of computers possible. By 1989, there were 50,000 users on the internet, mostly academic and military. This was the year that the ARPANET, funded by the U.S. Department of Defense, was open to the public. The, historical, the historic pattern for access to the internet is illustrated in this figure, which indicates the initial adoption was slow and then rose to the point that, today, half the world's population has some form of internet access. This represents an impressive rate of growth. Note, however, that the rate of change is relatively linear, even though the growth in the technological performance was exponential, reflecting Moore's law. 
As a result, the Internet's underlying technology has long been capable of serving 100% of the world's population. A combination of actions or inactions by individuals, organizations, and institutions accounts for the impressive reach of the Internet and the failure to reach even further. Today, there are a growing number of moonshot initiatives from governments, foundations, social entrepreneurs, and for-profit companies seeking innovative solutions to providing universal internet access. What if this deep investment of human and financial capital, energy, and innovation had begun as early as 1983? Moreover, internet access is not a binary distinction, with simple haves and have-nots. Across the globe, there are substantial disparities in the quality and reliability of computing and internet access, with billions of people having mobile-only access, inconsistent connectivity, or tiered access, with the faster tiers being wildly out of financial reach. Try writing and sharing a document with rich media on a flip phone or a low-end smartphone. Then, imagine trying to navigate CAD, computer-aided design, and CAM, computer-aided manufacturing workflows on that mobile phone. Nor are internet access and quality just developing world problems. The Joan Gans Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop, which does pioneering research on issues of digital inclusion, recently released a report on the digital divide in the United States. One-third of those below the poverty level in the U.S. rely on mobile-only internet access, and many experience regular interruptions to their internet service because of weak local infrastructure or an inability to pay the necessary monthly fees. Digital access is a continuum with real challenges for people at the lower end of the economic order. Given that nearly every job and much of the rest of human activity is now mediated by digital technologies, these digital divides have, not surprisingly, become key drivers of growing inequality in global wealth and income. Within the digital fabrication world, affordable and reliable internet access was cited as a clear threshold challenge by more than 175 fab leaders whom we surveyed in early 2017. Additional information on the survey and results are in the resources section at the end of this book, which I'll include in the description. Internet access was rated as very important by 80.4% of the respondents. At the same time, two-thirds, 66.9%, reported that it was also very difficult. This gap between importance and difficulty represents a threshold pain point constraining the exponential growth of digital fabrication. To understand these responses better, we use a data visualization approach that Joel developed with colleagues as a way to see points of alignment and misalignment among stakeholders. The third digital revolution doesn't depend only on the technological infrastructure of the first two digital revolutions. It also introduces new technologies that could easily make the current disparities much worse. Since digital fabrication requires access to a continually evolving array of hardware, software, and consumable materials, the raw materials used in fabrication, as well as space, computers, internet connectivity, and qualified staffing, the challenges of fab access are even greater than the challenges of the first two digital revolutions. In our survey of digital fabrication leaders, we asked about access to the needed software and hardware and the integration of software and hardware. Again, there were major gaps. Access to the equipment in a fab lab was seen as very important, but hard to obtain. There was a similar pattern with software. The situation was only slightly better for the integration of software and equipment, which is indicated on the next page. Mm -hmm. The responses on difficulty varied across software, equipment, and the interface between the two, with the most pain associated with software. When asked about difficulties with equipment, the responses on difficulty are bimodal, with over one-third indicating that equipment access was very difficult, and another third indicating it was very easy. As a map of stakeholder interests, this split is particularly challenging. If we don't bring up the bottom third before enhancing things for the top third, we risk a growing fab divide. As we noted in the introduction, when President Obama publicly declared that high-speed internet is a necessity, not a luxury, in 2015, it was a full half-century after the publication of Moore's paper. 
if we wait another half century for for a U.S. president or another world leader to realize that fab access is a necessity, just as electricity, water, and digital connectivity are, then there will almost certainly be creating a crippling fab divide. This, in turn, will exacerbate the existing digital divides, risking a future with even greater gaps in wealth and income, more technological unemployment, and further destabilization of society. If, on the other hand, we proactively leverage digital fabrication technologies to increase personal and community self-sufficiency, the benefits will ripple through all aspects of society. This could change how we conceptualize the very concept of work and other aspects of everyday life. Working toward the goal of universal fab access will require a focused, sustained, and aligned effort by those pioneering both the technical and the social systems powering the third digital revolution. While fab access is critical for everyone in society, it is particularly important for those who have been left behind in the first two digital revolutions. The most moving stories from our interviews came from fab labs in inner city and rural settings where youth have traditionally had limited access to tools for personal empowerment and self-sufficiency. Mel King, the longtime Boston community activist who created the South End Technology Center Fab Lab with Neil, highlights the impact on urban youth. Quote, we have a class here for folks who were formerly incarcerated or who have substance abuse issues. We have been doing this for a few years with the various agencies. Getting the folks into the Fab Lab brings back meaning for them. Seeing the expression on their faces when they, are, when they are creating something, usually for a loved one, lets us know that we are on the right track. I have seen lives transformed, end quote. Another example comes from the Vigyan Ashram School in rural India, where the idea of fab labs was first piloted. Yogesh Kulkarni, who manages the lab, describes how it empowers local youth, quote, We work with youth who are 14 to 20 years old, many of whom are school dropouts. At the Fab Lab, they develop a wide variety of skills in solving problems and learn the design process. We've had students go back to their villages and design hydroponic watering systems, which they had fabricated here in the lab. Some of the students have been able to purchase single machines such as a laser cutter and set up a local service business. Others have been able to raise money and launch Fab Labs." End quote. And the benefits won't be limited to youth and the previously disenfranchised. If the democratization of manufacturing can slow or rebalance the accelerating divide in income and wealth worldwide, it will benefit everyone. In, in the book The Spirit Level, Why More Equal Societies Almost Always Do Better, public health researchers Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson document how the healthiest and happiest societies have the narrowest gaps between the rich and poor. Digital fabrication technologies can be a key part of the solution in narrowing these gaps, but only if fab success is addressed in systematic and comprehensive ways. Chapter 6 further, further develops ways to address fab access and other threshold challenges. Fab Literacy The second threshold challenge is ensuring that individuals know how to use fab technologies once they have access to them. We were decades into the first two digital revolutions before educators, employers, parents, and policymakers realized that digital literacy was essential to surviving and thriving in the digital age. The digital divide has been as much about literally, literacy as access. Although there are different, different definitions for digital literacy, broadly speaking, it involves developing the skills, the knowledge, and the mindsets needed to understand and use digital technologies to accomplish personal and professional goals, as well as being a responsible digital citizen. Digital literacy includes everything from finding and consuming digital media to creating and communicating using digital technologies. The majority of people with digital access consume digital content and use simple tools like Snapchat. Most people have a limited understanding of the digital platforms and technologies that shape their daily lives. Youth and young adults are sending an average of eight hours a day immersed in digital media, but they are not necessarily becoming digitally literate. Consider the massive youth and young adult unemployment throughout the world. Even in regions where there is deep mobile penetration, many technology jobs are going unfilled. This digital creation gap, which is all about literacy, could easily be made much worse when creation goes from bits to atoms. Digital fabrication is hard. 
It introduces a set of new competencies, including the navigation of continually evolving CAD and CAM software, as well as additive and subtractive hardware, embedded computing, and an understanding of the biological and chemical properties of the materials used in fabrication. It also requires design thinking, creativity, collaboration, problem solving, and resiliency. These all require knowledge, skills, and mindsets that cross very different disciplines and domains and, as a result, are not currently well integrated. We, design, we define fab literacy as the social and technical competencies necessary for leveraging dig digital fabrication technologies to accomplish personal and professionally meaningful goals, as well as a commitment to the responsible use of the technologies. We cannot build toward a more self-sufficient, interconnected, and sustainable society without widespread fab literacy. Nadia Peek, a pioneer in personal fabrication at the Center for Bits and Atoms, argues that, quote, the number of fab labs may be growing exponentially, but the number of people empowered by the machines is not growing exponentially, end quote. She attributes this gap to the significant complexity involved in nearly all aspects of digital fabrication, quote, the software is archaic and difficult to learn. People can learn to 3D print a plastic thingamabob, but this doesn't mean they have full access to the means of production, end quote. In other words, access requires literacy. Digital fabrication is essentially a new language. As literacy scholar James Paul Gee points out, quote, literacy is only possible if there is a grammar. Grammar enables communication and simultaneous, simultaneously limits your choices, end quote. Gee notes that grammar is too a language as rules are to sports. A game of basketball or football is not viable unless all the participants agree to the rules. He also says that when you learn a language, you internalize perspectives without realizing it. Languages have affordances, enabling certain ways of thinking and actions, and limitations. Values and assumptions are built into grammar. In his How to Make Almost Anything class, Neil, in effect, introduced a language for digital fabrication. He initiated the creation of a grammar, a set of rules, and, to a great extent, the culture. The Fab Academy and all the different emerging extensions, like How to Grow Almost Anything, could be considered dialects of this foundational language. Even social constructs, such as the Fab Charter, which serves as a shared foundation for governance, operations, and growth of the Fab Lab movement, are part of this language. For a language to survive, it needs a foundational grammar, but it also must be adaptable and extensible. The maker movement, hackerspaces, tech shop, and other maker approaches all offer a variety of languages with diverse and overlapping grammar, rules, and cultures centering on how things get made. Each approach offers different strengths and weaknesses that appeal to different people. To cultivate fab literacy, we need to recognize that the fab community is developing new languages with foundational and emerging grammars, rules, and cultures. Building literacy at the level of the various actual languages used is key to socializing new entrants into the world of digital fabrication, as well as in facilitating dialogue and synergies across different fab, maker, hacker, and other communities. Digital fabrication not only involves a new literacy, but also builds on older types of literacy. As Guy cautions, quote, literacy in digital fabrication is dependent on multiple other literacies, such as reading, writing, and a variety of digital literacies. These older literacies may be reconstituted in the context of digital fabrication, but there is still a dependency upon them, end quote. To put the importance of traditional reading literacy in perspective, according to a 2013 study by the U.S. Department of Education, 32 million adults in the U.S. can't read, and close to a quarter of the population, 21%, reads below a fifth grade level. Another challenge related to fab literacy is the tools' ease of use. Many people throughout the ecosystem spoke of a strong desire for CAD-CAM workflows that were more intuitive and more accessible. But this desire was also matched by a deep concern that the tools not be so easy that they become black boxes, which allow people to make almost anything, but don't show people how to make almost anything. A black box is really the antithesis of the fab ethos. Captain Picard most likely would not have fixed the Star Trek replicator if his Earl Grey tea no longer came out hot. Jens Dyvik, founder of the Oslo Norway Fab Lab, describes this tension between the ease of use and a black box box approach. Quote, Neil's allusions to building the Star Trek replicator is a bit concerning. 
It encourages excessive consumption over empowering creation. This is a terrible future. You have your replicator at home, but so what? You have more stuff, but are you happy? Being able to easily make lots of stuff can be bad as well. That is a challenge that many people don't think about. When technolo- end quote. When technologies are complex, there is a risk that only a small class of priests, the creators, will have all the agency, and that the brighter laity, the consumers, lack the knowledge of how to shape the technology. Right now, the fab ecosystem does have a high priest class that is truly fluent in the language of digital fabrication. Consider the learning involved in just some of the topics introduced in Neil's How to Make Almost Anything course. 1. Digital Fabrication Principles and Practices 2. CAD, CAM, and Modeling 3. Computer-Controlled Cutting 4. Electronics Design and Production 5. Computer-Controlled Machining 6. Embedded Programming 7. 3D Molding and Casting 8. Collaborative Technical Development and Project Management 9. 3D scanning and printing. 10. Sensors, actuators, and displays. 11. Interface and application programming. 12. Embedded networking and communications. 13. Machine design. 14. Digital fabrication applications and implications. 15. Invention, intellectual property, and business models. And 16. Digital fabrication project development. Gains in fab literacy depends on gains in fab access. Like other forms of literacy, fab literacy requires enough time for individuals to progress from a limited working knowledge to proficiency, to mastery, to the ability to teach others. As with access, if we do not proactively lay the foundation for developing universal fab literacy, we will see the same widening of the existing divides that have been exacerbated by other literacy gaps, be they reading, writing, or digital literacy. If, however, we continue to develop new approaches for cultivating fab literacy, we are likely to see many benefits, ranging from specific workforce development skills to increasing personal capability. Scott Simonson directs the Engineering Fab Lab and the Additive Digital Manufacturing Program at Century College in White Bear Lake, Minnesota, a two-year college preparing people for the workforce. Scott observes that, quote, Industry is adapting to digital processes. We need to prepare the workforce for the jobs that are coming, end quote. He shares the example of a group of five students invited to meet with representatives from Wilbert Plastic Services, a thermoforming manufacturing company that makes parts for the auto industry and other sectors. The company suspected that 3D printing could reduce the two to four weeks needed to produce tooling for the injection molding equipment, but it did not have expertise in the technology. Wilbert asked if it could work with some of the students as consultants. Scott reports, over a series of three or four meetings, the students and the company officials identified jig fixtures for assembly lines that the students could prototype. In the first year of the program, students are already doing consulting at the leading edge of the field. End quote. The gains in literacy go beyond workforce preparation to increased personal capability. Scott teaches a version of Neil's class, How to Make Almost Anything, as part of a new two-year curriculum in additive and digital manufacturing. He originally planned for the capstone project to be for all the students to make their own 3D printer. In fact, four students are already doing this in the class. He jokes that he will now have to come up with a more challenging capstone project, but the deeper point is that these students are not just gaining literacy in using the equipment, they are developing both an understanding of the underlying technology and an ability to shape it." Enabling Ecosystems Widespread fab access and literacy are foundational parts of a more self-sufficient, interconnected, and sustainable society. Access and literacy are not required in a vacuum. The context also matters. At present, the context for digital fabrication includes an array of interacting, independent, and countervailing elements. A threshold challenge is to shape the context into an enabling ecosystem oriented toward greater self-sufficiency at individual and community levels. We focus here on five elements of an enabling ecosystem. These include cultivating methods for more effective collaboration and knowledge sharing, ensuring widely distributed mentorship and leadership, creating open and robust marketplaces for fab products and services, 
attracting a, attracting a diverse mix of public, private, and philanthropic financing, and designing effective forms of governance aligned with the emerging FAB community values. Often, the larger context is seen as fixed, exogenous, but we are identifying aspects of this ecosystem that can and must be shaped if digital fabrication is to grow at exponential rates and improve lives and society. Collaboration and Knowledge Sharing A key element of an enabling ecosystem for digital fabrication is the ability for anyone, anywhere, to collaborate and share knowledge, advice, failures, and successes with anyone, anywhere. Since digital fabrication requires a wide range of expertise, and since the technology is rapidly evolving, the ability for people and projects to be shared across the network is both necessary and a considerable challenge. With effective mechanisms for collaboration and knowledge sharing, people can accomplish collectively what they have been difficultly been doing individually. Network effects become possible. Consistent with Metcalfe's law, which was introduced in Chapter 1, collaboration begets more collaboration. Knowledge sharing generates new knowledge, and digital fabrication is better able to grow at an accelerating rate and empower more people. To achieve network effects, the digital fabrication ecosystem needs interoperability, social and technical. The architecture of the Fab Lab movement is designed, at least on the technical side, with this aim in mind. Fab Labs seek a common footprint for digital fabrication hardware and software, facilitating, facilitating collaboration and knowledge sharing within and across the global network of Fab Labs. Although there is a common hardware footprint amongst most labs, there is still a great deal of friction in the process. Digital fabrication is awash with a mishmash of open source and proprietary CAD and CAM software. This software variety and variability results in a great deal of fab fragmentation and friction when it comes to collaboration across fab labs. There is further complexity in bridging across the various configurations and cultures of maker spaces, hacker spaces, tech shop workshops, and other similar maker-centric spaces and communities. The challenge of interoperability and extensibility in the larger fab and maker ecosystem reveals a key tension, the desire for standardization and the resistance to hierarchical decision making. The process of developing standards that align the interests of interdependent but independent stakeholders is of course not new. Some standardization has been essential to everything from consumer electronics to transportation to the internet. History teaches a hard lesson here. As John Leslie King, former dean of the University of Michigan School of Information, sums it up, quote, Standards are easy to establish early on, when no one cares about the standard, and almost impossible later on, when it is clear that the standard is important. Then everyone still wants a standard, but as long as everyone else adopts their standard, end quote. To converge on standards for collaboration and knowledge sharing for digital fabrication, we need to address early on how diverse stakeholders will operate in an environment where no one person or organization is in charge. Progress will depend on effectively identifying interests, alignments, and misalignments in the current practices so that stakeholders, individuals, and organizations can advance their shared and separate interests. This process, which Joel and his research collaborative call lateral alignment, has been a challenge both within and across the different maker communities. In our survey of digital fabrication leaders, we asked about their connections to different types of associated spaces, with the option to check all that apply. Even though the survey was distributed through the Fab Foundation email list, the responses indicate a great deal of overlap across the communities, with 81.1% of the respondents indicating a connection to a local Fab Lab, 42.3% to a makerspace, 31.4% to a maker fair, and 17.1% to a hackerspace. When we asked about collaboration and social networking across these spaces, as indicated, three quarters reported high importance, while over a third reported it was very difficult to do, and more than half said it was at least somewhat difficult, indicating a key gap. These communities may operate with considerable overlap and synergy, but there is also a subtle but pervasive tension around language, identity, and cultures across fab labs, makerspaces, hackerspaces, tech shop facilities, and other emerging community resources for making. They are all growing in parallel, but there is tension around how much they can and should grow together. In the social sciences, we see that managing the tension between homophily, 
connecting with those like yourself, and diversity, appreciating those different from yourself, involves constant balance and iteration. Achieving the balance begins with an understanding of the roots of the similarities and the differences. Each of these communities has its own origin story. When we spoke with Dale Dougherty, founder and CEO of Maker Media, about the launching of Make Magazine and Maker Fairs, he used an analogy to an early gym. Quote, The first gyms were bodybuilding workshops populated by serious, mostly male, weightlifters. This was not welcoming for many people who just wanted to work out but were not serious weightlifters, end quote. He thought about using the word hack or hacker, but felt that these terms would not be welcoming or friendly to many groups, especially schools. He also looked at Fab Labs, as Neil was featured in the first issue of Make Magazine, but was concerned that, quote, that the cost and technical complexity of launching a Fab Lab was beyond the reach of most people, end quote. He wanted anyone, anywhere, to be able to start a maker space or participate in a maker fair with little cost and little difficulty. Ultimately, at his daughter's suggestion, he went with the simple word make because, as she put it, everyone likes making things. Interestingly, as both maker and fab communities have been spreading over the last decade, the two movements have been growing closer together in some ways. The cost of digital fabrication hardware and software, while still considerable, has steadily been reduced. And the technological sophistication of makerspaces has steadily increased. Dougherty jokes that he sees Neil as the R&D arm of the maker movement. Neil embraces this description. In many ways, the Fab Lab movement is the cutting edge of the broader maker movement in terms of taking advantage of rapidly advancing digital fabrication technologies to more effectively make a broader range of things, with both form and function at multiple scales. Hackerspaces and tech shop have different origins and cultures. Hackerspaces have always been more decentralized, with a loose, informally distributed, and community-driven culture. The hackerspace community has a volunteer-run website with a wiki, a blog, and other resources. But there is no founder or central organization, and each organization has different operating models grounded in how its local community or members define their culture. TechShop, which was launched in 2006, is a membership-based, do-it-yourself workshop and prototyping studio that provides makers of all ages and skill levels affordable open access to a wide range of tools, equipment, resources, and workspace. TechShop features a wide variety of digital and non-digital tools and operates on a membership model. Many people are confused about the differences between these maker-centric organizations and communities. In a 2003 article in Make magazine, Gui Valcanti Cavalvanti ex attempts to explain the differences. Observing that many knowledgeable people don't distinguish between the terms hackerspace and makerspace, he counters, quote, I personally find that I need to differentiate between the two, because at this point, the concepts and representations behind the words have diverged significantly for me, end quote. Cavalcanti also addresses the tech shop and fab lab communities, both of which he sees as encompassed by the larger language of makerspaces, quote, in my mind, both Tech Shop and Fab Lab are makerspace franchises. They focus on creation from scratch, through multiple types of media. Ironically, both came into being before the term makerspace was widely used, and as such, their trademark names have more staying power right now than the overarching term." End quote. Of course, not everyone will agree that maker is the overarching term. Moreover, Fab Labs are neither a franchised business nor a trademark although Tech Shop is both. Cavalcanti, however, does highlight how the shared identities across these communities are joined by real differences in approach, culture, and even core values. It is both natural and healthy for many maker-centric communities to emerge with varying capabilities, varying cultures, and operating practices. That said, an enabling ecosystem depends on a community's ability to collaborate and share knowledge especially with respect to digital fabrication, where designs and fabrication can be digitally, digitally shared, adapted, and co-created. If diverse stakeholders can align around interoperable standards, then many more people and groups can benefit while maintaining their own identity and operating models. Mentorship and Leadership A key element of an enabling 
Fab ecosystem is ensuring widely distributed leadership and mentorship across the community. Sherry Lassiter, who leads the Fab Foundation, points out the importance of people. Quote, I used to think that growing the network was just about bringing down the cost of launching new Fab Labs. Cost is part of it, but it is much more about the people. It is not just a matter of putting in new labs in a top-down way. To provide access to digital fabrication, we need to build the human capability to go with the new labs, and we need sustainable leadership of the labs that have been launched." End quote. When people launch a new fab lab, the equipment will often be up and running in a matter of weeks, or at most a few months. But getting this needed social system up and running is another story. It can take years to get the staffing, internal governance, sustainable financial models, and relations with key external stakeholders. So, right from the start, the social systems lag the technical ones in a fab lab. Many of the early fab labs do have strong leadership, as they were founded by deeply committed social entrepreneurs who have worked through the diverse challenges that come with launching and running a fab lab. Less visible are the people who have attempted and failed to launch or sustain a fab lab. As the demand for community fabrication grows, a threshold challenge in the ecosystem will be the parallel need for growth in leadership capacity. A related hurdle for the FAB ecosystem is finding experienced mentors who have the time to support all the individuals who need help navigating their way around the software, hardware, and materials. FAB pioneers like Jen Zdivik and Nadja Peak, folks who have set up FAB labs and trained local leadership, are much in demand. And yet, it's hard for them to balance their own research and passion projects with the growing number of requests for advice and mentorship. In fact, this was a common struggle among many of the fab pioneers we spoke with. Many fab labs don't have on-staff dedicated mentors who can help guide the wide variety of projects that come through their door. This challenge for the larger fab ecosystem is likely to grow as the number of fab labs grow and as the technology enables fabrication to become more personal instead of community-based. In addition to the need for distributed on-site mentorship, there is also a need for a wide variety of resources providing just-in-time guidance and feedback for those who don't have access to a local mentor and who run into challenges while tackling a project. Overall, a large majority of fab leaders 87.3% reported that access to mentors in their local labs was very important. At the same time, over a third said that this was very difficult to do and nearly half said that it was at least somewhat difficult. Mentoring is not just about working with the software and hardware needed for digital fabrication. Another key knowledge or resource gap in the current fab ecosystem is guidance on the raw materials used in digital fabrication. This is an area that Alicia Garmulowitz, a professor at Universidad de Santiago in Chile, is attempting to address. Her research is focused on developing a circular economy where resources and fab labs can be sourced locally and continually reused as opposed to a linear economy where resources are extracted, used, and discarded. She points out, quote, we need to understand that materials are, that are around us that so that we can create a high-performance economy with natural polymers and other ingredients which are underused. This requires distributed information regarding the availability and usability of local materials." End quote. Currently, resources like this are very limited across the FAB environment. The challenge of, access, of accessing just-in-time knowledge and feedback can also be part of the design of the hardware and software. Nadia Peak describes the current complexity, the need for resources, and the opportunity for feedback to be built in the technology itself. Quote, There are thousands of settings on a laser cutter for different materials, the frequency of the pulsing of the laser, the speed at which it moves, etc. I know this in my head and can answer questions when people ask, but there is no shared resource with this information. Peak adds that it is not just the details of the separate machines, continuing, there are lots of complex components and they all need to be standardized and interoperable with ways to adjust to technology that is constantly evolving. We need to develop the infrastructure so that knowledge and agency are implicit in the technology, end quote. It is critical, as Peak clearly highlights, that the hardware and software become more intuitive and provide better feedback to the users. 
This idea of people and machines working effectively together is central to the fab experience and has been the subject of several recent books about the future. For example, MIT researchers Andrew McAfee and Eric Brynjolfsson, co-authors of The Second Machine Age, Work, Progress, and Prosperity in a Time of Brilliant Technologies, explore areas of the current and future economy where the synergy between people and machines is greater than either individually. They, along with others who highlight the need to race with the machines, often cite freestyle chess as an evocative example of technology complementing humans. In this example, in this type of chess competition, computers are paired up with humans to compete against supercomputers, which have beaten the world's top chess masters. In these competitions, teams of people and computers typically beat the top supercomputer or the top chess master playing individually. But designing fab technologies to work more effectively with the fab creators will be another key component of an enabling fab ecosystem. Robust Marketplace Platforms The fab ecosystem will all also require open and robust marketplace platforms, which are the vehicles for the discovery, sharing, buying, and selling of digital fabrication designs, products, and services. A key lesson from the first two digital revolutions is that great wealth and influence accrue to those who control the leading marketplace platforms in any given ecosystem. Although Apple is best known for its computers and phones, its app store marketplace and distribution platform are among its most valuable and fast-growing assets. This, the same is true of the Google Play mobile app store, Valve's Steam video game distribution platform and gaming community, community and Amazon's massive online retail platform, to name just a few. These organizations have had an outsized influence in shaping the ecosystems in which they operate. The marketplace platform providers make money regardless of the size of any given transaction. For apps, games, music, and other content, platform providers typically take a 30% cut on every transaction. The cost of tools for creating digital content have dramatically dropped, and distribution has theoretically been democratized. But as Neil points out, the app ecosystem is more than famine than feast. For the vast majority of content creators, with the bulk of the revenues going to the platform owners and the top content providers. Equally significant, these platform providers have become the gatekeepers for which apps, games, products, and designs are highlighted, usually through a blend of algorithmic, the most popular selections rise to the top, and curatorial, editorial selections, processes. A critical question, therefore, is who will control the primary platforms for discovering, sharing, buying, and selling the fab designs, products, and services? The organizations that emerge in this role will shape the culture through the values built into their algorithmic and curatorial processes. The filtering in these processes is not neutral. Every decision has built-in assumptions, and there is considerable variation in the ways that community impact is integrated in the algorithmic and curatorial processes. An obvious example is the assumption built into the Google and Amazon algorithms, which shape so much of the information we see and the purchases we make. Even if the ecosystem emerges more like cooking ingredients, as Neil suggests, there will still be gatekeepers, the equivalent of large supermarket chains that determine which products and services are highlighted. Although we are starting to see a few companies providing marketplaces and online services for 3D printing or laser cutting, no dominant player or players have emerged. In the first two digital revolutions, the leading platform-based marketplace tended to be dominated by a few for-profit companies. Given the largely bottom-up, emergent nature of the fab and maker movements, the dominant marketplaces might emerge from the non-profit side. Nonprofits like Wikipedia, making knowledge accessible, and Khan Academy, making learning accessible, have experienced exponential growth and deep influence in their sectors, although they are more about knowledge and content than the discovery of processes of discovery, sharing, and selling of products and services. The organizations that emerge with the leading fab marketplace platforms will have great influence on the culture of the fab ecosystem. Diverse Financing Another key foundational component of an enabling ecosystem is the mechanisms for a diverse mix of private, public, and philanthropic funding for research and development, as well as stage-based financing for a mix of for-profit, 
nonprofit, and mission-based organizations across the FAB community. For FAB Labs to maintain their exponential rate of growth, there will need to be significant funding for continued fundamental research, support for the growing network of community-based FAB Labs, and the launching of new labs and networks, as well as impact-friendly commercial financing, angel, venture capital, and private equity for companies developing FAB hardware, software, materials, and services. The FAB ecosystem was born out of a research and development grant from NSF. On the roadmap that Neil envisions for digital fabrication, there are still major technology challenges to be overcome. For community fabrication to transition to truly personal fabrication, fundamental research is still needed. Traditionally, science and technology research has been funded by government institutions like NSF, the National Institute of Health, DARPA, and other government agencies, and their counterparts in other countries. And yet, we are living in a time when the efficacy of many core institutions of government, not to mention the value of fundamental research in science and social science, are being questioned. Although innovation can and must happen in the private sector, underestimating the impact of public funding is not only dangerous, but is not supported by history. In her book, The Entrepreneurial State, economist Mariana Mazzucato tackles the question of public funding head-on. She covers DARPA's role in the development of the Internet through the creation of ARPANET. She also describes how government research funding in the U.S. and Europe laid the scientific foundations for everything from the touchscreen technologies powering smartphones to many pharmaceutical and medical breakthroughs. She highlights research funding by the National Institutes of Health and numerous other high-profile examples of fundamental research leading, years later, to products and services that have helped transform society. Kumar Garg, who served for eight years at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy with a focus on education and innovation, suggested that, quote, the key question for leaders in government is identifying the biggest pain points where the mechanisms of government or public interest funding are best equipped to address, end quote. He also points out that, with limited financial and human capital, difficult choices often need to be made between a systems approach, where resources are used to address multiple pain points, versus a narrower approach, which starts by addressing the deepest pain point and prioritizes financial and human capital around that particular pain point. For people interested in starting a fab lab, a common first question is, how much does it cost to start a lab? Sherry Lassiter from the Fab Foundation estimates that the average budget for launching a community fab lab and running it for two years is approximately $250,000 U.S. in 2017. The estimate includes hardware, software, consumable materials, space, and a mix of paid and volunteer staff to set up and run the lab. Funding for existing labs has come from a variety of sources, governments, communities, local businesses, universities, philanthropic organizations, investment, crowdfunding, and most often, a combination of these. Ongoing funding has come from all of these sources, plus CAT classes, fees for access, membership fees, and project grants. The early cohort of Fab Lab pioneers are all passionate social entrepreneurs who have been able to cobble together both the startup and the ongoing operational funding. For the network to continue to grow, however, the overall costs will need to come down, the variety of strategic funders will need to increase, and sustainable business models will need to be honed and adapted to meet local needs. A reduction in the overall infrastructure costs will require iteration and continuous improvement in hardware and software. A robust, enabling market ecosystem can make hardware and software better, faster, and cheaper, and can support the innovation needed to ensure the availability of environmentally friendly and cost-effective raw materials. One benefit of all the press surrounding 3D printing is that it has inspired startups and attracted investment capital, which has resulted in competition, innovation, and cost reduction. We need to see the same market and investment support for subtractive hardware, consumable materials, and other areas where innovation and cost reductions are essential. This level of financial engagement will happen only if the products and services coming through the FAB ecosystem become must-haves instead of just nice-to-haves. Today, there are individuals for whom having access to a FAB lab is a must-have. Some of these people consider lab time a necessity because of what they can make in a FAB lab. 
These include industrial designers and modern craft workers who require digital fabrication for their jobs. The same is true for some entrepreneurs, small businesses, and large commercial enterprises that need cost-effective, rapid prototyping. They must have the elements of a fab lab for the work they do. For most of the fab community, however, the must-haves are more about the process of digital fabrication and being part of a community of makers and innovators. At this point in the development of the fab ecosystem, most people we spoke with said that the richness of the community, rather than the products being made, and the collaborative process of making is what makes fab labs so special. Wow, that's important. Throughout the larger fab ecosystem, there is a tension between the process of making things with the digital fabrication tools and the resulting quality and usefulness of what is made. Maurice Conti, who directs applied research and innovation for Autodesk, a leading producer of digital design software, addresses both the enthusiasm for participating in fabrication and the limits on what can now be produced. Quote, in terms of people able to do one-of-a-kind one personal fabrication, that is super interesting, but is it practical? I have seen the way Fab Labs change culture. It is an infectious thing. Even here, with a world-class facility and expert staff, people are more excited about the process, with the output being rarely on par with commercial-grade goods. End quote. It is one thing to learn how to laser cut your name on a keychain or print a cute little 3D figure, but it is another to be able to make almost anything. Despite the great educational value in the process of learning digital fabrication skills, it will still be a long time before the average person can make most of what he or she consumes. Even Neil, who has access to the most advanced digital fabrication tools and technologies in his home and at work, makes only a tiny fraction of what he consumes. This will change over time as the technology continues to improve, but in the interim, there is still great value in the process of making things in a fab lab and being part of the growing community. The process of digital fabrication, when well scaffolded, cultivates critical thinking, design thinking, problem solving, creativity, collaboration, and resilience, as well as a variety of digital literacies and growth in understanding of domains ranging from engineering to material science. For a growing number of educators, at least those who believe in learning by doing and collaborative project-based learning, this cultivation of knowledge, skills, and mindsets are certainly must-haves. Similarly, the ways in which digital fabrication builds a motivation for and literacy in essential STEM skills is becoming a must-have for many educators, policymakers, and industries looking for future employees who can tackle a wide range of new challenges using rapidly developing technologies. Hakan Carlson, the chief herder in the Lingen Alps Fab Lab in northern Orway, highlights the benefits of Fab Labs in the story of how three teenage girls who spent much of their free time in the Fab Lab all left town for university and went on to become doctors. People in the local towns would point to the Lingen Fab Lab and comment how, quote, that strange little house on the hill in Lingen makes doctors, end quote. Importantly, they came home after their medical training, and it isn't only doctors. Local youth who spent time in the lab have gone on to a variety of professional careers for which they credit their experience in the lab, from entrepreneurs to professors. For example, Hans Christian Bruvald, the boy who Neil described in Chapter 1, has recently become an associate professor at a local Norwegian university. Hakan was one of the first to recognize that fab labs cultivate a wide variety of knowledge, skills, and mindsets that help people not only make almost anything, but also become almost anything. While these process-oriented benefits are great and need to be expanded to engage the broader population, must-have fab products and services will also need to emerge. There will be no single killer app or service that will define the fab ecosystem, but instead an evolving blend. In the early stages of community fab labs, the killer apps are likely to be about services that enable individuals to have deeply empowering experiences making things, rather than any specific thing being made. As the fab lab network grows and we start to see early adopters for personal or small business fabrication, new killer apps and services will emerge, specific designs or projects that become must-haves to make money, save money, or provide great entertainment. These apps are analogous to the killer apps in the early days of the personal computer, such as word processing, spreadsheets, email, and computer games. 
Over time, the killer app shifted from specific products to the enabling platforms and tools that democratized the creation of content on the internet. These included tools for making web pages, blogs, and applications, as well as tools for uploading and sharing pictures, videos, news, and other information, which enabled the mass publishing and sharing of digital content. Neil answers the must-have question, in part, by pointing to the personal part of fabrication. He argues that the killer app for digital fabrication is not what you can buy in stores, but the ability to make what you can't buy in stores, products for a market as small as one person. To realize this vision, however, we will need to make great progress on enabling ecosystems, and these, in turn, need to be effectively governed. Distributed Governance Decision-making and coordination are difficult in any organization. The complexity increases proportionally with distributed arrangements in which the parties are independent entities, yet are still interdependent. Although often not an early priority with new technologies, effective governance across distributed communities is a critical element of an enabling ecosystem. Neil cites the governance of the internet as an example of a distributed structure that is effective. Although internet governance operates remarkably well given its scale and distributed nature, it has no authority or influence over critical issues such as access, literacy, civility, and other matters on a global basis. The challenge for digital fabrication is to advance decision-making and coordination capabilities so that threshold challenges are addressed constructively while still maintaining its distributed and independent nature. At present, there is no shared platform for governance of digital fabrication in the ecosystem. The leading enabling practice, the FAB Charter, is incomplete. There is nothing wrong with the current language in the Charter. However, it is missing key elements common to many charters, including a statement of the overarching shared vision, mechanisms for decision-making, and mechanisms for resolving disputes. Moreover, the ecosystem lacks a full chartering process in which the charter truly represents an agreement among diverse stakeholders on the rules of the game. Here is the full text of the FAB Charter. What is a FAB Lab? FAB Labs are a global network of local labs, enabling invention by providing access to tools for digital fabrication. What is in a FAB Lab? FAB Labs share an evolving inventory of core capabilities to make almost anything, allowing people and projects to be shared. What does a Fab Lab network provide? Operational, educational, technical, financial, and logistical assistance beyond what's available in one lab. Who can use a Fab Lab? Fab Labs are available to as a community resource, offering open access for individuals as well as scheduled access for programs. What are your responsibilities? First, safety, not hurting people or machines. Second, operations, assisting with cleaning, maintaining, and improving the lab. And knowledge, contributing to documentation and instruction. Who owns Fab Lab Inventions? Designs and processes developed in Fab Labs can be protected and sold however an inventor chooses, but should remain available for individuals to use and learn from. How can businesses use a Fab Lab? Commercial activities can be prototyped and incubated in a fab lab, but they must not conflict with other uses. They should grow beyond, rather than within, the lab, and they are expected to benefit the inventors, labs, and networks that contribute to their, their success. In our survey of fab leaders, the majority, almost 70%, reported that awareness and utilization of the fab charter is important, but approximately 11% felt strongly that it was not important. Furthermore, 56% of respondents reported that it was difficult to utilize. Most tellingly, a significant percentage, over 20%, responded to both questions with either don't know or not applicable. When we shared these findings with Neil, he observed that the charter was essential early on, but is less important now since the shared understandings are embedded in the way the FAB Academy operates and other parts of the FAB landscape. In our interviews and survey, we have indeed observed the set of shared FAB values across the community. To the best of our ability, we have summarized these as follows. Finding meaning, purpose, and joy in making a FAB lab. Enabling collaboration and community building within and across FAB labs. Cultivating individual and collective agency in the digital fabrication process. 
working toward personal and societal sustainability through digital fabrication. Digital fabrication should be benefit to everyone, not just the fortunate few. These shared values across the current ecosystem do seem to be serving the same function as a charter. Indeed, these shared values go beyond what is stated in the current charter, and some elements of the charter conflict with current practice. For example, under Who Can Use a Fab Lab, the standard is that Fab Labs offer open access for individuals as well as scheduled access for programs. This standard is not always possible for Fab Labs in K-12 schools, colleges and universities, museums, and other institutions for which there may be constraints on open access. Still, just stating the shared values raises the question of whether some codification, an updating of the charter and process to ensure that it is shared, is needed as the ecosystem grows. Particularly in an age of accelerating change, charters need to be living documents. A mindset for this can be found in the U.S. Constitution and other chartering documents that provide an enduring framework, combined with the capacity to adapt. Constructing such mechanisms is not easy, but represents a crucial codification of how things are meant to operate in a given domain. Challenges going forward is to, is to ensure that enabling platforms, practices, and people who help with governance, all part of the ecosystem, can handle the exponential rates at which things will change in the third digital revolution. Mitigating risk. Technology enthusiasts will acknowledge risk, but their enthusiasm centers on the beneficial potential of the technology. This drives innovation, which is good. However, a clear-eyed early look at the third digital revolution also reveals considerable risks that need to be documented, understood, and addressed, even if they may never be fully solved. The issues of fab access in literacy, for example, surface the risk of a potentially destructive fab divide. Other risks include environmental degradation associated with consumable materials, misuse of the technology, i.e. bad people making bad things, and unintended consequences that come with people's ability to manipulate bits, atoms, and genes at an increasingly granular level. The two overall arching institutional objectives in society are creating value and mitigating harm. A central challenge in mitigating harm focuses on who, or what combination of stakeholders, will hold responsibility for each risk. Any large commercial project or public project, for that there is always a crucial negotiation around who will hold which risks. The process begins with the identification of all known risks in the broad categories from which unknown risks might emerge. Then, if the negotiation goes well, each risk is allocated to the party or parties best able to manage a given risk. The person or group receives payment or other compensation for holding the risk. If these negotiations can't reach resolution, the project is not likely to go forward. A current example of this is the negotiations around who holds the risk for self-driving cars, the car manufacturers, the owners of the cars, the insurance companies, the development teams who wrote the algorithms, the government, and many others. For the third digital revolution, however, there is no prescribed mechanism for negotiating with multiple stakeholders on risk. Thus, things may advance, but the responsibility for managing risk is incompletely specified. The failure to systematically assign responsibility poses what might be considered a meta-risk for the entire third digital revolution. In the absence of risk mitigation agreements, key risks will be left unmanaged, and when catastrophic events do occur, there will be inadequate responses and resources, which the further risk of contentious finger-pointing making things worse. Begin with environmental risks. The current hype around 3D printing has some pundits predicting a 3D printer on every desk and in every home, paraphrasing the original Microsoft statement involving PCs. Considering current technology, this goal would be an environmental disaster. The 3D printing process is basically the smushing together of various materials. Even though one common material, PLA or polylactic acid, is plant-based, others are environmentally unfriendly, de derived from petrochemicals, and can't be easily recycled. As Thomas Diaz from the Barcelona Fab Lab says, quote, Fab Labs are using more and more plywood with glue, plastics that use ABS, and electronics that depend on acrylics. This is definitely not sustainable, end quote. 
when hundreds of millions of people are iterating and tinkering with environmentally unsustainable materials, the potential environmental risks of the third digital revolution include a severe depletion of natural resources, a dramatic rise in carbon emissions from the development and shipping of these materials, and the excessive waste currently generated in the digital fabrication process. And yet, if we can develop environmentally friendly and reusable consumable materials for digital fabrication, there could be great environmental dividends. In the Fab City white paper, Diaz points out cities' current role in environmental degradation. Quote, Extreme industrialization and globalization have turned cities into the most voracious consumers of materials, and they are overwhelmingly the source of carbon emissions through both direct and embodied energy consumption. We need to imagine, reimagine the cities and how they operate, end quote. As we will see in later chapters, the development of better resources on the use and reuse of local materials and the advent of digital materials that can be assembled and disassembled will be essential to avoid the environmental risks of universal personal fabrication. Another risk in developing countries derives from weak institutions. Multinational corporations will be able to establish digital fabrication capabilities faster than many local institutional leaders. This is already beginning, with the United Postal Parcel Service setting up rapid prototyping centers in its warehouse facilities to fabricate and deliver certain products on demand. Here, the risk is that the gatekeepers to the technology will not be distributed community centers, but will be primarily large corporate enterprises that are more analogous to what has happened with the first two digital revolutions. In this scenario, the third digital revolution will come more rapidly to the developing world, but the type of change will be mediated by what is and is not profitable for business, which may or may not be aligned with Fab Lab values. There is also the more sinister risk that ill-intentioned people will make bad things. It is already starting to happen. Stories of 3D printed firearms are quickly becoming viral across social media, making multiple laps around the internet. The fabrication of weapons is a real risk. Neil responds to this concern by pointing out that fab labs are not really the most efficient way to make firearms, that there are much more efficient ways to procure a gun than building one in a lab. His argument, however, becomes less persuasive as the, as the tools for digital fabrication get better, faster, and cheaper. If the goal is to enable also, almost anyone to make almost anything, then certainly this goal will accelerate the making of dangerous and destructive things. There is no fail-safe way to solve this problem, but there are multiple ways to help mitigate the risks. One element of mitigation is through a combination of mentorship and oversight at a local lab level. Yogesh Kulkarni from the Fab Lab outside Pune, India, has actively addressed this challenge. He believes that Fab Labs can be an important tool to help identify potentially at-risk youth and guide them towards more productive paths. When asked about the risk that these same youths would use the lab to make weapons, he said that close oversight is key. Quote, Although the risk is small, we will, for example, see a student use a grinder to sharpen a knife. When this happens, we stop them and explain that this is not what the lab is for. End quote. This approach is similar to advances in community policing, where small, early incidents are caught in a systematic way to set a tone and culture make, that makes the larger, more catastrophic events much less likely. A, rela a related risk at a systems level is cyber terrorism in a world of digital fabrication and, even more concerning, a world of digital materials. This points to the need for a distributed infrastructure without single system-wide failure points. Moreover, we know that system solutions will have to be social as well as technical. Although Alan and Joel have spent their careers in very different sectors, both have insights on innovative approaches to managing technological risk. These insights come from their respective domains, workplace and labor practices, from Joel, and digital entertainment and online communities, from Alan. This speaks to the importance of cross-sector collaboration and knowledge sharing, as virtually every sector and domain is having to address a steady stream of risks introduced by accelerating technologies. We'll start with Joel. He was on one of two teams that the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, engaged to conduct safety and risk assessment on a prospective Moon to Mars mission. One team used what is called Probabilistic Risk, risk Assessment, or PRA, which counts all known possible failures, 
attaches a probability to each one, and then calculates the overall risk of the mission. The other team, led by MIT's Nancy Levison, used a system safety model, which looks at the operation of the overall system and identifies points of vulnerability according to a systems dynamics model of interdependencies. One approach decomposes the risks into their component parts, and the other looks at how things add up and interconnect with each other. Unfortunately, risk analysis is too often focused just on the PRA-style decomposition of risks, with less attention to the system's approach. In this case, Joel recalls seeing the introduction to the PRA report, which stated that it was a complete assessment of all known risks associated with the mission, except those associated with software and organizational factors. Needless to say, risks in the third digital revolution cannot only be addressed by decomposing the risk for individual component parts. Beyond formal risk mitigation processes, some legal aspects of risks are also some legal aspects are also a threshold challenge. Because some physical aspect, aspects are critical to safety, fab labs must ensure that such objects are what they say they are. A counterfeit or even a well-meaning substitute component could subvert a product's design for safety. The challenge involves issues of authentication and intellectual property. Gonzalo Rey, who is the chief technology officer for Moog, which makes precision control parts for aerospace, medical, energy, and other sectors, discusses authenticity. Quote, Our company doesn't worry about authenticity. People like to have a name brand watch, for example. What is urgent for us is that metal printing is becoming real. If you are doing things like an airplane or a surgical part, you want to know that it is an authentic part. This is in the same technical bucket as the designer watch, involving the digital rights that go with the design. In safety critical situations, it is essential." End quote. Another risk that is already emerging around new technologies involves labor practices. Much of the work in the current digital fabrication ecosystem is volunteer or part-time contingent work referred to as gig economy jobs. The emerging mechanisms to share designs, products, and services commercially also involve fragmented work. This is part of what labor economist David Weil terms the fissured economy, where police policy objectives of fair pay, workplace safety, prevention of discrimination, opportunities for representation, and related protections are getting harder to reinforce. Here, the risk today is that the work in fab labs will be part of the larger current societal challenge with fragmented work. This risk will vary across the settings in which digital fabrication takes place, like schools, colleges, universities, museums, community labs, industrial settings, and others, with some settings involving more fragmented work than others. In time, there is a greater risk around which labor and workplace practices will emerge to characterize the ecosystem. It is possible the collaborative and other constructive practices will be institutionalized, which would be excellent. The risk is that arrangements that increase power differences and reduce collaboration will dominate instead. For example, the platforms for the sharing of designs and the exchange of products and services could end up with a small number of owners for whom the platforms are highly profitable, with limited benefits for the many millions of contributors. Such a situation would be a barrier to more self-sufficient and sustainable society. The behavioral strategies associated with making dangerous or destructive things are part of a larger risk mitigation approach, centered on building in norms that cut across all digital communities, addressing critical issues around digital civility and mitigating toxic behavior. An interesting example of how to do this comes from an unlikely source, the video game industry. Racism, homophobia, sexism, and general toxicity have become pervasive in some of the larger online gaming communities. Game developers have had to tackle this problem head-on for both business and ethical reasons. A company proactively addressing this challenge is Riot Games, developer of the hugely popular League of Legends. With close to 70 million players, the community is massive and global. Riot Games found that toxic behavior was frustrating many existing community members and scaring off new players. Since early design priorities did not prioritize the potential for these antisocial behaviors, the company had to rethink some of its core community and design assumptions. Riot Games engaged social scientists, neuroscientists, and game developers to study the problem. 
They studied in detail who in the community was driving the toxic behavior, as well as how this behavior spread and how it influenced the community. They also studied the same factors in positive behavior. The researchers then openly experimented with ways to integrate mechanisms into the flow of the game to reduce the toxic and increase the positive behaviors. The effort included various initiatives. The company tried adding peer reviews to the game to help determine if particular behaves, behaviors were toxic. Another initiative was the offering of incentives, along with messages and tips, to encourage positive behaviors among the gamers. The company also ensured that the penalties for different types of objectionable behavior were aligned with the nature and severity of the transgressions. They also used machine learning algorithms to track progress in real time across multiple languages and cultures. At the core of this approach was the clear, specific, and nearly instant feedback given to the player when toxic behavior happened. Doing nothing both condones and reinforces toxic behavior. Equally important was a mix of transparency and humility, not overstating what was intended, in terms of the process and carefully culting the better angels of the community. The results have been impressive. When Nature Magazine interviewed Jeffrey Lin, the lead designer of social systems at Riot Games, he highlighted how an in-game warning that harassment leads to poor game performance, quote, reduced negative attitudes by 8.3%. Verbal abuse by 6.2% and offensive language by 11% compared with just controls. End quote. A positive message about players' cooperation reduced offensive language by 6.2%. And after the country released its machine learning algorithm, verbal toxicity relative to other ranked games, the most competitive level among video games, was reduced by 40%. Riot Games has said that it is going to publish its results so that others can leverage these insights. In this example, the software developers were willing to hold the risk since it was affecting their business model and their customer experience. Building motivation for positive behavior into the design and continual optimization of the software is just one example of many possible built-in technological solutions to managing risk. A key aspect of the science underlying digital technologies involve the concepts of error correction, which Neil explores more fully in the next chapter. Error correction is more difficult for, with people in societies, but the Riot Games example indicates some of the ways in which it is possible. Thinking along these lines, machines might someday sense certain misuses of materials or might apply artificial intelligence learning when new forms of misuse emerge. In the development of such approaches and responses to possible misuse incidents, people will still need to make decisions. Thus, an essential part of any risk mitigation strategy involves having a broad array of forums and mechanisms dedicated to tracking and addressing issues when they arise, combined with anticipating what might be on the horizon and then combining the social processes with the technology. While the Riot Games example illustrates the use of technology to nudge behavior toward more civil forms of discourse, it assumes a threshold acceptance of the technology itself. Betty Barrett, a co-founder of the Champaign-Urbana Community Fab Lab and co-leader for the research team examining stakeholder alignment among U.S. Fab Labs, points to a deeper risk. Exponential change, quote, exponential change is not always onwards and upwards. Rates of change can go backwards. There are forces in the world that see it in their interest to head backwards. This includes fundamentalist beliefs in anti-intellectualism. She continues, The intense disbelief and distrust in science limits the rate of change. This is a huge battle, and digital fabrication will be subject to the terror that is felt by many around technological change. End quote. There is some irony, of course, that these constraining views are magnified and accelerating in their impact because of technology. Barrett notes two risks here. First, digital fabrication is not ready to face what could be violent ideological headwinds that find its very existence offensive. Second, that some parts of the world will not face such strong resistance and will race ahead, deepening the fab divide. These challenges rooted in fear could deepen as we reach the later stages of the third digital revolution and as new risks emerge that are more opaque and even existential. Neil often talks about how machines will make machines, and, as we will learn in future chapters, assemblers assembling assemblers. But it is not clear where humans fit into these evocative descriptions. 
How does the process start and stop? Does it stop? Could it run amok? When people hear about machines making machines and assemblers assembling assemblers, it is hard for them not to leap to visions of rogue AI wreaking havoc on humanity. When we consider the many existential threats to humanity, the inevitable interweaving of AI with digital fabrication is certainly on the list. Here, the threshold challenge begins with cultivating an informed and engaged population around the future of the third digital revolution. The technology needs to be presented in a way that is inviting, that highlights clear and understandable capabilities within reach and addresses genuine fears. As we will explore more deeply in Chapter 6, we must simultaneously appeal to the head, logic-centric approaches, the heart, emotion-centric approaches, and the hands, practical hands-on approaches. This is to ensure that social systems can co-evolve effectively alongside the accelerating technologies. The potential of the third digital revolution also raises questions about who in society will be the arbiters of the values that are embedded in the technology. Will we trust the technologists, or will we also engage ethicists, social scientists, storytellers, religious leaders, and mediators? We can almost envision processes for addressing the moral issues associated with digital technology, but it is more difficult to have confidence that the results of these processes will be seen as legitimate and will prove durable. Although fab labs must mitigate their own risks, they can also play a role in reducing risk in society. As Neil introduces in Chapter 1, Dina Elzanfali co-founded a fab lab in Cairo around the same time as the January 2011 Egyptian Revolution. In fact, it is located not far from Tahrir Square. Amid the tumult of the protest, the fab lab turned out to be a neutral, safe place. Elzanfali recalls that it was, quote, a bubble of positive energy and enthusiasm. It was somehow related to the revolution, but it was also separate, end quote. Even as digital fabrication brings new risks, fab labs also foster community and innovation in ways that can reduce risk at times of protest and change. Another area where digital fabrication capability can reduce risk was articulated by U.S. Representative Bill Foster. Focusing on national security, Foster points out that there are military and natural disaster threats that could disable substantial parts of the economy. In these scenarios, he points to distributed fabrication as an essential capability for rebuilding a well-functioning society after catastrophes. Foster further describes a military scenario that involves the increased use of robots in warfare. Under this scenario, an invading power could position militarized robots in every, on every street corner. The ability to fight back might well hinge on local and national digital fabrication capability to generate rapid prototype responses to unexpected technology, technology threats. Foster has proposed a bill in Congress indicating the value of a national fab lab network. He recognizes that many benefits of fab labs as sources of learning, community, and innovation in addition to national security. But for many in Congress, attention increases when the emphasis is on a network of labs with the potential to mitigate catastrophic risks in society. Grand Challenges Society faces many grand challenges, each with global risks attached. The United Nations has a list of 17 sustainable development goals, including many that can be advanced by the third digital revolution, such as no poverty, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, decent work and economic growth, reduced inequality, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, quality education, and peace, justice, and strong institutions. Neil even ran a fab lab at the launch of the goals. There is a reason that foundations, professional societies, and global organizations are all articulating grand challenges. It is because most of society's institutions are not set up to effectively tackle these complex and continually evolving, cross-cutting issues. As economic historian and Nobel Prize winner Douglas North defined them in 1990, institutions are, more, are the humanly derived constraints that shape human interaction. Hmm. More simply, they are the rules of the game, and digital fabrication has the potential to be a game-changer for societal institutions. Realizing this potential, however, involves first navigating the inherited institutional context. 
many existing institutions, such as those associated with education, business, communities, and the environment, are struggling to keep pace with accelerating technologies. For the most part, the existing institutions represent sources of conservatism that pose potential barriers for something new, like digital fabrication. The third digital revolution will simultaneously engage the existing institutional actors and reveal cracks in the system, cracks that will be exploited by the emerging, more agile people, platforms, and processes. In our survey, we asked the fab pioneers to look ahead to the year 2025 and anticipate the degree to which digital fabrication will transform key elements of society education and training, business and entrepreneurship, government and civic organizations, environmental and economic sustainability, and community and culture. Of this group, many had roles that connected to these institutional arrangements. With respect to design and fabrication, 64.7% reported having educational roles, 54% reported community organizing roles, and 36% reported public leadership roles. The accompanying figure shows the pioneers' average responses about how great an impact digital fabrication would have on various aspects of society on a numerical rating scale, where zero means not at all and 10 means complete transformation. Given that 2025 is less than a decade away, those closest to digital fabrication technologies anticipate considerable transformation, with the most change anticipated in educational institutions and practices, and the least in government and civic organizations. Understand that these are the pioneers' predictions, not what they desire. The point of the prediction is not to describe what you want, but rather to anticipate where things are headed and figure out where to intervene or how to act now to accomplish shared objectives. Thus, a lesson from this predictive exercise is that those closest to the new technology expect that government and civic organizations will be lagging in the technology. The prediction should be taken as a challenge for those institutional leaders to lean forward and, in effect, prove them wrong. As Neil noted in Chapter 1, the UN leaders did not see an immediate connection between grand challenges and digital fabrication. But when they did, their whole attitude toward digital fabrication shifted from considering, a, considering it a nice-to-have to begin viewing it as a potential must-have. For the third digital revolution to truly become a revolution, it will need to do more than demonstrate exponential gains in technical performance. The technology must clearly address enduring societal needs with models that can be replicated and locally adapted for broad-based impact. Just because there is a conceptual fit with the UN Sustainable Development Goals doesn't mean that it is the reality on the ground. As Tom Khalil, former Deputy Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and a strong advocate of the maker and fab movements, points out, quote, the ability of the maker or fab communities to help solve particular societal problems is a key yardstick to measure progress. It is not just about self-expression, end quote. He goes on to cite examples such as makers and people with disabilities working together to design assistive technologies and makers and educators working together to reduce dropout rates in schools. Beyond progress on tangible impacts at the level of societal grand challenges, there are also risks involving intangible impacts. Derek Mancini, who served as project director for the design and construction of the Center for Nanoscale Materials at Argonne National Labs, observes, quote, People are drawn to digital fabrication as a reaction to the accelerating changes in technology. There was a craft movement in response to the Industrial Revolution, and the draw of the fab and maker movements is comparable. When people reach out to maker technology, it d reveals a deep desire for individual control, end quote. In this way, the rise of digital fabrication has great potential for people to achieve greater personal control at a time of accelerating change. To summarize, woven through the mix of exhilaration and frustration that exist in the fab ecosystem are the four threshold challenges central to the future of the third in digital revolution. Universal fab access, fab literacy, an enabling fab ecosystem, and mechanisms to mitigate potential risks. There are also persistent tensions such as balancing the ease of use of the technology and avoiding black box solutions. Reconciling the need for interoperable standards and protocols with the distributed and independent nature of the community. 
and balancing non-hierarchical decision-making across diverse stakeholders with the various needs for collective action. Our combined ability to meet these challenges and manage these tensions will likely determine whether we can tip the balance toward an optimistic vision of the future where all people can make almost anything, or a future where some people can almost make anything. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.